One, two, Sometimes three. they. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending um, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust meeting uh, December 14th. Uh, we are going to call uh, the, our meeting to order. Uh, we have a quorum, so we will actually go ahead and begin. Um, I'm going to start first before introducing our new member. I'm going to ask for us to review the November meeting minutes. Um, and is there anyone who would like to raise any omissions or any edits that are necessary for the November meeting minutes? Yes. Go ahead, Grover. Um, so in the meeting minutes, it said, um, it said that I mentioned something about during when I was homeless at the University of Massachusetts in college and I met and I did not go to the University of Massachusetts. So I did mention that I was homeless in college, but not um, at UMass. So I just don't want that in the public record because it's incorrect. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's very important. OK, so we will edit um, the minutes. Are there any other um, omissions or corrections that are necessary? Okay, um, we will edit the, the minutes and then we will send them out again and then we'll vote for them in January. Um, I don't see thank Rob. No, thank you, Grover, and I'm sorry that uh, I know I review them. Okay, Rob's here too, okay. Um, I know I review them, so um, I did not catch that. So I apologize. Okay, so now I have the pleasure of introducing our new trust member, uh, Gaston, um, and maybe Gaston, if you could just um, give us a, a little bit of, um, you know, a brief introduction about yourself and okay. um, yes, what, what you think sure. would be great for us yeah. to know. Uh, thank you. So um, I live in Amherst with uh, my wife and two boys who are in high school. We moved in 2018 from DC, but we had lived in the area back in 04 to 07 when my older son was born. I was practicing law then and then went to practice in New York City before going to do a PhD in business ethics and then teach uh, business ethics in DC. Moved back up uh, to Amherst for our kids to finish school and be uh, closer to family in Boston. And um, I'm now teaching at Northeastern in, in the business school. And uh, I've also been serving the town through the license commission. And I'm you know, very pleased to be able to support the, the work of the trust. On behalf of the whole trust, I want to welcome you and we're very excited to have you. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Um, we have one more vacancy and we're hoping that that vacancy will also be filled pretty soon. So we're hoping that that vacancy by our January 11th meeting will be filled and then we will have a full nine member trust. Um, so very exciting. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, both Carol and I had the opportunity to um, interview Gaston um, and we're very, very excited in terms of what you bring to the trust and to us in this group and at a wonderful um, time as well since we're heading into a strategic planning process, uh, which we'll learn more about this evening. So Grover, you still have your hand up, so i um, not sure if you want to say something or it's just up no, because you're- No, it's just a tech thing. I don't know why it's not putting my hand down, sorry. <laughs> No problem. I just want to make sure I want to pay attention. Uh, it looks like it's now down and I think, yes, it's down. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a, uh, if I don't see someone's hand, if someone can just let me know, um, just don't want to make, I want to make sure um, I don't miss anything, anyone. All right. So we're now going to move. Um, I'm going to ask if Jamie Gruber can join us. Uh, Jamie uh, is the uh, project manager uh, for the Wayfinders project uh, for um, Belchertown Road and uh, South East Street. I always have those two a little bit wrong, so I hope I have that correctly. Um, he actually shared, uh, and we shared um, the slides, but we would like to invite Jamie to present um, on the project. And we also want to have a conversation about how we can work together to 
update the community and possibly do some um, community outreach um, just in terms of the status as well. So thank you, Jamie, for joining us. And we're going to try to put up your slides. Um, I can share my screen if that's 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 probably the best. Uh, Jamie, is that giving you the option to share? Uh, yep. Yeah. Hold on. Let's see. Um, can you see my Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jamie. We can. Okay. Is it the full slide? Great. Um, would you be able to invite um, uh, Michelle McIndair and Bruce Ehrlich to the panelist board as well if they're at the meeting? Looks like Bruce was invited and Michelle's invited. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, well, good evening. Um, first, I'd like to thank you, the members of the trust, for having us here this evening to talk about our new development in Amherst. As you mentioned, I'm Jamie Gruber, a project manager at Wayfinders. And here with me tonight is our senior project manager, Michelle McAdair, who I've been working very closely with, along with our senior vice president, uh, Bruce Ehrlich. Uh, Wayfinders builds and advocates for a thriving and equitable region by improving the stability and economic mobility of families and individuals, together with developing and managing a wide range of housing to support strong communities, is our mission statement. And our organization provides services in the housing arena from homelessness through home ownership. We are members of the real estate development team with the creation of preservation of affordable housing as our goal. Um, Wayfinders currently owns and manages approximately 800 rental units um, in Western Massachusetts across multiple sites, primarily up and down the 91 corridor. Some of our developments include Butternut Farm and Olympia Oaks in Amherst. Northampton, we have Live 155 and the lumber yard on Pleasant Street, along with Sargent House on Bridge Street. Library Commons is also one of our Holyoke developments. These are just some of our local developments that have been recently completed. The pro our proposed development in Amherst includes two sites just east of downtown, uh, 31 Southeast Street, which will create 31 units, and 70 Belcher Town Road, um, which will add 47 units. In order to maximize the housing, we, we looked at the most efficiently um, using the buildable area at each site. Our plans include buildings that will provide barrier-free housing and elevator access to all floors and units. The buildings will be designed and built with sustainability as a core goal, and we will incorporate energy efficiency measures consistent with passive house and enterprise green communities. The buildings will be all electric and we'll, we will seek to install solar PV arrays and for on-site renewable energy. Our development will have on-site property management allowing for a meaningful, meaningful presence as well. Here's a, a, a rendering of the Southeast, Southeast Street School site. And this will create 31 units with a mix ranging from studios a studio to three bedrooms. The site will include the adaptive reuse of the existing school into six new apartments, provide a common laundry room and indoor bike storage. The new construction addition will create 25 units that will include the on-site office and community room for residents. Here is the Southeast Street site plan. The footprint of the existing school building is shown in red and the new construction portion is shown in the tan on the front portion of the lot aligned with the road. The on-site parking area will be located generally in the same area that the existing school's parking lot is. There will be a pedestrian path along the southern side of the parking or left side of the screen that will allow for access to the town-owned field Although it's not shown, it would be on the upper left-hand portion of the screen. There will also be a patio courtyard area for residents between the school and the new construction, 
and the community room will open up directly onto this area. Now the Belcher Town Road site will be entirely new construction. This three-story building will create 47 units with a mix also ranging from studios to three bedrooms. Similar to the East Street School site, the elevator access will be provided to all levels and, and we will also have an indoor bike storage, laundry room, and community room for the residents in addition to a management office at this site as well. Here is the Belcher Town Road site plan. Um, the site will have parking and drop-off pickup area in the rear of the building. And the U-shaped footprint allows for a common patio courtyard area for residents that will also connect directly to the community room within the building. The apartment income mix across both sites is shown here. Some of these numbers may change, but this is generally where the numbers will fall. So 23 of the units will be for families and individuals making 30% of the area mean, median income or less. Seven of the units will be reserved for families and individuals making 50% of the area median income or less. 19 will be for families and individuals making 60% of the AMI or less. And 19 of the units will be for families and individuals who make the make up to 80% of the area mean income. Approximately 68 of the 78 units will be income restricted, while the remaining 10 will be reserved for market rate. The in these income limits, you may be from familiar to a lot of you, but I wanna provide a few examples of the income limits for the various household sizes. The income limits are updated by HUD each year, and these are the calculated limits for 2023. So currently, 60% of area median income for a family of four in our region is around $59,760 per year. That the same four person household at 60% AMI with an annual income of up to $59,760 dollars a year could expect to pay around $1,554 a month, including all the utilities for a three bedroom unit. All rents will include utilities, electricity, heat, air conditioning, and hot water. And this will be the same across all income levels. These, these rents are, are up, the LIHTC rents are updated each year and subject to change. And here is a schedule of the development. It is currently in the design and due diligence phase with permitting starting in 2024. Following the permitting with the town, we will pursue our financing and funding applications for the development. With the state, due to the competitive funding round process, we expect the financing to be completed, to be complete leading to the development into construction into 2027. And then we could further expect an 18 month construction period wrapping up and being fully leased in 2028. Thank you very much. That concludes the presentation on the, on the development. And uh, I'd like to open it up for uh, any questions that you might have or discussion. Thank you, Jamie. I'll, uh, Allegra, you have a, your hand up. a few questions about income and then a question about site. Um, question number one, the market rate housing that has to be at, is it the Southeast Street site? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to clarify on the slide that said preliminary rents there will be some sort of subsidy attached to the unit and the residents will pay 30% of their income. It won't be like a, you know, this is a less a less expensive unit, but you still will pay X rate. Does that make sense? I'm not sure that I understand um, the question. Is there a specific income level? 
Maybe you can put the slide back up okay. for once. Is this helpful, Allegra? Yes, I think I might have figured it out. So is it saying that anybody who is at 30% of AMI will receive some sort of subsidy so that their rent will only be 30% of their income at that tier level? So if somebody comes in at 30% and all the 30% units are occupied, they would need to be able to afford another unit either at a 50 or a 60, which they probably could not. So, because so, we, Jamie, how many units again do we have at 30? I believe there's around, is it 23? Yeah, 23. Units. All of the 23 units will have a rental subsidy. No, I, but Allegra, are you asking, for instance, sorry, I'm just going to cut in, that if, say, someone is actually earning 25% AMI, they qualify for the 30, so then the rent listed, whether, say, it's 900, is more than 30% of their income, will the rent be adjusted to be no more than 30%? So instead of, say, being 872 for, or whatever it is for a studio, it would be 850. Is that is that kind of what you're asking, Allegra? That is what I was asking, but from looking at the chart with preliminary rents, it looks like across the 30% AMI, that would that would have a rental subsidy, whereas at 50% of AMI, it would be a fixed rental price for the type of unit that it is, rather than, I was reading, I... I read, I understand my question now, but I think I've caused more confusion. <laughs> um, so I originally read it like, um, like I'm pointing at things, but so I read, I thought at first that the, I didn't realize that the 30% of resident income was at the 30% AMI. I thought it was underneath like each unit. So at first I was like, wait, all of these are subsidized. That's lovely. But even having 23 with a subsidy is lovely. Uh, and I mean a subsidy based on the person's income, not for the development itself. Um, but I have clarified my question and I apologize if I have caused confusion for others. Bruce, did you want to respond to Allegra or oh, is it something different? Sorry. Sure, it's just another clarification on this important point. Um, which is, so we have 23 units that will be set aside purely for individuals at 30% or below, and all of those will be rent subsidized. We agree on that. And those residents will pay no more than 30% of their income. They'll pay exactly 30%. For the, if another resident, if another prospective tenant who is very low income, extremely low income, 30% of AMI, if they have a mobile Section 8 voucher or certificate, OK, they can occupy any of the other units and use their mobile voucher in the other units, which is actually quite common. So when we set aside 23, 30 percent units, it is often the case that there are also other residents at that income level occupying higher income units, but they're affording them with a rent subsidy if they're if they don't have a rent subsidy and they're coming out of pocket they won't really be able to afford those 50 60 you know percent tiers but there's many residents with housing subsidies and they would love to move here so th they'll get some of the other units we we can't predict how many but it's at least one and probably significantly more than one thank you bruce i think that's very helpful carol Hi, uh, thanks for all of this. I have a couple of questions and they're mostly related to what's changed from when you suggested this in the first place. Two of which are, I, I'm looking at the thing that we got earlier and I don't seem to remember that there are quite this many different AMI levels. It looked like there was 30 and 60 and now there's 30, 50, 60 and workforce. So maybe workforce is 80. I don't know. So maybe it's 30. Anyway, 50 seems like a new one. Um, and I wondered 
why that happened. And I would say also, surprisingly, but kind of wonderfully, I guess, unless there's some downside to it, there are more units here. There's 78 units and you thought there would only be 70. Three of them are studios. You didn't think there would be studios at all before. I'm just curious if there's any any thing you can say about why these changes happened. I know things happen, so it, maybe there isn't, but I'm curious if there is an answer. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, we've been working with our design team um, to try to find a, a efficiencies in the design and um, keeping the, the buildings within the same footprint that they were originally. Uh, we, we worked a lot with the architect to, to, to work within the roof lines to get in those, those additional units. Um, I believe uh, there's maybe six additional units at the um, Belchertown Road site. And there were three or four additional units that we were able to, you know, get into kind of various er areas with um, to in, um, you know, within the existing footprint of the building. So that was how we were able to, you know, get a few additional units. And we saw that, you know, the benefit of adding a studio here or there was, um, if, if there was room for it, that, um, that's how that came to be. And the, the different income tiers, um, worked out with, uh, a financing option where it's uh, it's the average income approach that we're using, and what that and what that does is it it it's sort of a, a weighted average of all the tiers of income across across it. And the eighty percent AMI is is we're showing it as the eighty percent AMI that was previously possibly shown as as workforce, workforce in our yeah. in our in our um in our slides. So those those are the um those are probably the major changes. Well, so let, let me tell you my paranoid worry is that there's actually more units here because you couldn't afford to make the thing work without more units and therefore everything is smaller and tighter and people don't have as much room. Is that the case? I hope not, but I thought I'd say it in so many words so you could tell me how wrong I am. Nope, that's not the case at all. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um now, the one other question I had actually, or wait, maybe Bruce or Rob wants to say something. Why well, should I ask my other question, or do you want to go ahead? Um, the other thing I noticed different from when we first looked at it was the the timeline, which seems to have come to be a year longer than it was last time when we looked at it. It looked like rent up was going to be in 2027, and now it looks like rent up is going to be in 2028. And I wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah, some of our um, due diligence items and the way that um, they they worked out with the funding round applications, we'll be going in for the funding round next year once the permitting with the town is completed, and then once we're on that track, it should it should follow that, and that's that would be the reason for that. Thank you, Bruce. Did you want to? Sorry, Carol. Bruce, did you also want to add something to that? Yeah, Jamie, could you just go to that slide for a second? The timeline. Is the, you know, these are all really good questions and they deserve complete you know, answers. So, you know, the financing, it looks like it's the longest time thing here. You know, what's that about? And, and you know, Jamie said it, but I'll just elaborate on it. You know, the project we hope is going to be permitted by the end of next year, early 2025, we can't apply for state financing. You know, the state is providing most of the um, flexible financing here. We can't apply for state financing until we are through zoning. We need zoning approval in order to submit our first application to the state. And then there's a line out the door of other affordable housing developers around the state who are looking for funds. And you know, there's a shortage of funds, you know. Uh, there's a state bond bill of what, $4 billion that's gonna be going into the legislature this year, or it's already gone in. But we, it can take a year and a half or two years easily, unfortunately, to secure the state financing. And that that's why that green bar is as long as it is. But somehow you had a better shot at, maybe the timing of the permitting 
pushed the financing out a year or something. I just, because you did a timeline before that was shorter and the financing wasn't really very much different. So I'm, I don't know. I think the early due diligence took a little longer. Um, okay. Just working things out with everyone and getting everything signed and took longer than anticipated. Okay, thank I you. I, I think I do remember that. Rob, go ahead. Um, could you speak a little bit about uh, the on-site management and support services? Is it 24-7? Is it business hours? Uh, what sort of services are, are going to be offered? Michelle, would you? So we have um, management. There will be somebody on site during regular business hours. We do have a 24 hour emergency number um, for tenants or you know anybody to contact our management office. Um, but they are only there during business hours. We haven't put together our service plan but we will have a service plan. We do have resident engagement that will also be at these sites. So the resident engagement um, staff will, will ensure that anybody who's living here who needs assistance, maybe with childcare or, um, you know, just wants to go back to school, they'll be there for that. They'll be there to, you know, direct them and which, to agencies who can help them. Um, some of the agencies may be, it may be wayfinders that, that we're directing to if they're behind on their rent or something like that. Um, but the service plan has not been crafted yet. But we will have a resident engagement person along with property management at the site. Great. Um, I know uh, Carol and I actually were very heavily involved in writing the RFR, so that's very good to hear because that was very uh, was a really important point for us, uh, especially in terms of we want to ensure with affordable housing that there is way before anyone is even close to an eviction process that there is uh, engagement and prevention that happens uh, in the properties that we're involved in. So that's really important. Um, I have a question, which is uh, when you talked about, um, you know, you're you're going to go through the permitting process, um, and that has to happen before you can even get state financing. I know the permitting process sometimes, um, if community members haven't been engaged with beforehand, uh, and um, they may not be on board with this, there might be, um, you know, some some. Um, resistance to this. So I'm wondering what kind of community outreach um, have you been doing? I know we did a community forum almost over a year ago, um, but what kind of community outreach have you done in terms of abutters and the areas? And are you planning anything? And um, how do you see our role in helping you um, educate the community and um, getting people on board for this wonderful project? Um, yeah, so I've been um, in contact with with some of the uh, abutters that have that have uh, re returned my calls and, and and spoke to them to kind of keep them in the loop as to the um, you know what the what the development is is going to look like and and how it's how it's shaping up and just internally as a team we were thinking that it would be a good time to probably have another public forum type meeting similar to the one that we had, I think it was last September, and, um, you know, would look um, to the trust to, to help out it, as, as, as you, as you did with that, to, um, to uh, engage the community and then, and then possibly, um, you know, we were thinking that that could be a virtual one, maybe, you know, late January, February, possibly into, you know, maybe even into, into March with a um with an in-person one you know closer as we get to starting the, the the zoning board of appeals process um 
in in say in say May or so. Um, that that was kind of the schedule that we had talked about as a team. I'm not sure if the trust would agree with with that or has anything to add or or, or would suggest. Any. I'll open that. it up to others. Uh, Nate, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I think the trust should have a meeting, you know, sooner, uh, especially if they submit their PEL that starts, you know, the kind of the public process for this, you know, it's kind of like the pre-permitting phase. And so, um, you know, I think sooner in Jan you know, January would be better just to stay ahead of it, um, you know, and have it out there. And I think, you know, this is public, this presentation, but we could, you know, typically we start a web page. We have, you know, an online form to receive comments, especially when the PEL is received. Uh, and so then we'll set that all up, but it'd be great to have, you know, a landing uh, spot, uh, typically it's through the zoning board because that's where the permit goes through, but we can link to it from the trust page. I think we could start putting information up there and then, you know, maybe uh, if not, I mean, if not tonight, then sometime, um, It'd be great maybe tonight to figure out when, you know, what kind of, you know, is it the last two weeks in January? Do we have a few ideas of dates and it could get finalized later, but I think that would be a great time to do it just to, you know, not wait too long. Um, Cause the original timeline was to submit the project eligibility soon and then enter permitting in the summer and have that be concluded in the fall. So they could submit to the preliminary funding round um, then. And so, you know, really, and I think if the trust, I think, Jamie, if we waited to March to have our first meeting, it's, I think it's probably too long. I think it'd be nice to have it sooner. And, you know, if there are any concerns of a butters or anyone, we can try to address it or, you know, explain things. So. Yeah, I think planning, planning wise, the sooner the better, but I can't, uh, just because we're going into a strategic planning process, I'm just wondering January. Um, so maybe early February would be best for us. But, um, you know, both Carol and I are available, Jamie, if you, you know, want to reach out to us about thinking about how to plan this together. Um, certainly, you know, we're available to do that. Um, I agree. I think, you know, having a, another community forum, it would be really important. And I think in an in-person one would also be important as well. I know the construction piece is way in the future, but um, I know I travel through those roads often and just thinking about construction. And so having a pre-plan to help people reduce their anxiety, there's a school there. I know there are lots of parents that go through there to get to, you know, get the kids to school, get the kids out of school. Um, a lot of people travel into Amherst to, you know, either go to UMass or work in um, Amherst. So I think, you know, alleviating some of the concerns that people may have about both Route 9 as well as um, East Street, um, the sooner the better. Um, so we're absolutely available to start planning with you um, on having a community forum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's great. And and we're working with a, our, our uh, construction manager contractor now, and, 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 you know, we can definitely follow up with them to find out, you know, as to if what they anticipate for, if there's any going to be any disruption to the road or minimal, um, you know, with most of the construction taking place on site and, and that sort of thing. So we can definitely confirm a lot of that information to help alleviate, um, you know, any sort of unknowns, and, um, you know, stresses or anything like that, that you mentioned. So yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Thank um, you, Jamie. Grover, um, you have your hand up um, before yeah, we move I on. So Okay. I'm just noting that the timeline for the new school site building, which will be across the street from the South Street, is it's scheduled currently to be finished before you begin construction. But if the school project gets pushed back, there's a possibility that two giant construction projects would be happening right across the street from each other. And so I'm just noting in advance that a higher level of collaboration so that that's not happening might be might head off concerns thanks very good point well i want to thank you jamie bruce michelle for taking the time um to talk with us and to brainstorm with us um this is really such an important project and being partners with you on this um as i said before carol and i are available um and i think you know creating a community forum sooner than later um, in terms of what Nate suggested uh, would be really uh, important um, so we can get the support we need through the permitting process or at least not any 
any stalling of the permitting process so we can make sure that this project moves forward with the timelines you have currently, and that we can be successful with these timelines. Mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and so we're probably going to put you back into attendees. Right. And I'm going to Thank turn you. it. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 I'm going to turn the agenda, uh, turn it over to Carol now. Okay, thanks. We have um, we have a couple of town-ish updates that we are hoping to do before eight o'clock when we expect that uh, Shelley Goring from from MHP will come and share the strategic planning project plan with us. Plan, plan, plan. Anyway, um, I think what we what we would like to hear about, I don't know actually whether, I think it's going to be from Nate, but it might be from Greg. I'm not sure. We wanted to know something about what support of rental, what rental support the town has uh, recently provided and how. And we also wanted to know something about what the town's use of the housing ARPA funds has been. So I will turn it over to whichever of you I'm supposed to turn it over to. Yeah, I can take this one and I'll I'll throw softballs to Greg if he's if he wants to answer. No. The um <laughs> yeah, the um, you know, currently the town is using ARPA money for rental assistance. It's uh there was an initial allocation of 150,000 and then another hundred thousand. Um, you know, so it's spending that down. You know, in previous years, uh, you know, I mean we could go back, say back five years, seven years, the town's allocated CPA money, uh, you know, CDBG funds for direct assistance um, for rental subsidy. And so through different organizations um, has provided that assistance. And so, you know, over, you know, from, and I'd say in the past seven years, the town's probably provided over half a million dollars um, in direct subsidy. Uh, Wayfinders and other agencies like Community Action also administered rental subsidy you know, through the pandemic and afterward, the housing trust did as well, right? And so I think that was, you know, I think if you added all the sources there, it's again, over half a million. Actually, I think it might be closer to a million. Uh, and then um, um, there's other ARPA money that's uh, being provided for family outreach to do um, kind of wraparound services for households looking for housing. So it's not a subsidy for housing, but it's also providing services for people to help apply for applications or do paperwork. And so the town does offer those services. You know, it is tricky um, with funding. So a uh, block grant can come um, and is used almost every year to fund family outreach or other similar organizations. CPA is voted on um, on a project specific basis. So uh, for a bit, it was giving money uh, through Amherst Community Connections as a direct subsidy. Uh, kind of similar to maybe what's happening with Craig's doors and, and the trust funding. And so it was kind of an application based uh, response. Um, we've done it before with town funds. There's um, it's tricky because of anti aid amendment uh, and other um, regulations, financial you know regulations that it's difficult for local funds to be used that way. Uh, grant funds, though, can be. And so, you know, I think there's always a, there's usually some type of service that's happening for a direct uh, rental subsidy uh, in it. You know, I think it has, you know, for the trust, I think it, you know, actually ha isn't here. And so we were going to postpone that, that um, her discussion and we can wait to have that. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, there's short term and long term strategies for housing. And so subsidy is one of them. And I think that can be a discussion of how we'd want to look at that going forward uh, in terms of ARPA funding. You know, there was a million dollars for housing, a million dollars for homelessness or addressing homelessness. And then there was, like I mentioned, other funding for services. And so of the million for housing, uh, most, most of that was used. Uh, I was Greg, Greg, you're going to share your screen. Yeah, it, this is um, not as up to date, but the uh, Wayfinders will be receiving 600,000 in ARPA funding for housing. And then there's been another hundred thousand in uh, due diligence, and so there is about three hundred thousand or a little more than three hundred thousand in the affordable housing pot uh, for the homelessness fund. The million dollars, 
most of it has been toward the VFW. So uh, the town purchased the property for 775,000 and has put, um, you know, another 50,000 or more into, um, you know, uh, material cleanup, it'll be for demolition, and then for, you know, conceptual planning for the site. So there's about 150,000 left in the homelessness pot. And, you know, ostensibly that 150,000 will be used for the VFW site for further engineering studies or whatever needs to be done on that site. Um, in terms of the housing funding, uh, we had been thinking there might, you know, there could be a proposal or two that would come in. Uh, you know, the town has to spend so much or allocate so much by 2024 and spend it all by 2026. And so we're on track to do that. Uh, the, you know, the remaining housing money, um, you know, the town had put in a CPA proposal. I don't know if Carol and Erica went to the CPA committee meeting tonight for um, VFW, for Strong Street or for South Amherst campus. There's an old elementary school on the South Common. And so the ARPA money could also be used to study those to for those projects. Um, some of it might be to wait and see what happens with some of the current projects in the pipeline in case costs increase. We have flexibility there with some funding if necessary. And so, um, you know, it's just being a little judicious in terms of how that gets spent um, just because of how, you know, interest rates and costs of construction are just really unpredictable. And so, uh, you know, we haven't allocated it yet, but it's, it's, you know, we have ideas of how we could. Uh, Carol, you're muted. Do people have questions for Nate about this, about is what he just said? I would say that because Greg pointed it out to me, I looked at that sheet that he just had um, on on his, that he shared on his screen, and it's on the town website. And so if you need to know how to find it, I had trouble, but Greg yeah. knows how to find it. So I would, yeah, um, it's actually it's actually kind of hard to find. You almost have to keyword search if you just type in ARPA. Uh, as a keyword in the town website, it's in the finance department, but it's somewhat um, buried through links. So if you just searched ARPA reports, that's probably the quickest way to get to it. Um, I was actually trying to do that at the beginning of this meeting too, just saying how we could get, <laughs> how easy is it to get there? Um, yeah. So, so if somebody wants to study it more, it's, it's there to look at. And I just, so, but are there questions of Nate, Erica? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify. I think, Nate, if I heard this correctly, there is a million dollars designated for housing, for affordable housing through ARPA, and 600000 has already been um, uh, designated or given to Wayfinders, and somewhere along the way, there was 100000 here and there somewhere, but you still have about 300000 left um, of ARPA funding that would be designated for affordable housing. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, I, I think it's actually a little bit more than 300,000. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. The um, Wayfinders, they're not on the call. We have an agreement. It's going through um, approval right now. There's just some details to work out. Then and that's, I, I, that's 600,000, that agreement that's going through? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's And is that for the project we just heard about? It is. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it'll happen. It just has to, you know, there's some legal details that need to be worked out in terms of how we categorize ARPA money. Uh, and so um, we're just working that out, but it's not, you know, it's not like the money will go somewhere else. It's really just has to get through that process. Uh, the reason why I raised this, um, so you actually mentioned um, Carol and I, uh, we've been at CPA. Carol actually did a phenomenal job at last time presenting the proposal. Uh, and then uh, we've both done public comments. And then today, um, the town, uh, in collaboration with us, we all looked at our asks. Ours was for 500000 We were asked to think about it because it's a huge shortfall. Um, and there are a lot of really important projects that CPA wants to fund and thinks it's important to fund. Um, we actually um, agreed to reduce our request by 40%. So from 500,000 to 300,000 um, and the town reduced theirs about 125,000. 
Um, but I think, you know, it's really important to know that when we work together and so, you know, if the town requires a little bit more money for some of the projects like VFW or the South Amherst school becomes, you know, a viable property for us or strong street, but becomes even more viable than it, you know, has been for a few years, then we might support you. But knowing that you have $300,000 in ARPA for affordable housing is good to know. <laughs> so thank you for giving us that information. Yeah, yeah I our, our, sure, our, our ARPA right. administrator said it was um, kind of spoken for, but I, I don't I don't think it is. I think uh, originally we thought it, it. Greg, did you confirm that? You're shaking your the, head. That, that, that internal email was my bad, uh, and um, she did not say that. Um, okay. Oh, so, okay. yeah, yeah. That, that, that was an incorrect read of her email by me. Um, okay. So your, your numbers are correct. So we just correct it. The other money is no, is we have so we've, not. No, nah, it's not. There was one email that said that we had spent all, but like you know, seventy thousand of the million for housing. But it's really you know we spent you know three hundred six hundred fifty thousand, and we have three hundred fifty left or whatever the number is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean it could go to VFW site the three fifty for construction. Um, you know, I think. Uh, you know, that process hopefully will start in 24, really trying to look at how to program that site and get, you know, um, a request for proposals going. Uh, it'll be probably a pretty big project. Um, we probably can't wait that long with ARPA money, but, you know, I think there's some discussion about, you know, what do we, how do we fund the pre-development costs there? And, you know, is how much do, does the town uh, invest in that? And so, I th hopefully in the next you know few months we kind of start working on that a little bit more uh you know with the trust and have others involved and kind of move that along any other questions or comments or actually seeing that we have i shelly isn't here yet i don't think she said she wanted to be on at eight and it's not quite eight we have 11 minutes so if anyone has any questions for Nate or Greg of any of the other projects that we've been kind of following along, or Nate, if you have any other updates on any of the town stuff about housing that's going on that you feel like sharing with us, now would be a good time. I look like Allegra had her hand raised or was going to raise her hand. I had my actual hand raised, not my Zoom hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't notice. <laughs> my that's bad. Okay. Because uh, then I put it down. But I um, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that ARPA funds have to be spent by 2026. Is that correct? Yes, my understanding that um, yeah, that I think I think all the funds have to be allocated or or um, encumbered in contracts by the end of 24. Okay. And spent by 20 the end of 26. Okay. So in terms of if there were other projects, so the projects that we have that are actually kind of in viable planning stages would be with Valley CDC, the um, Amherst Community Homes, the one on that we just heard about, and then the VFW, those would be projects that are for all intents and purposes already in the planning phase. That Right. Yeah. I mean, internally, we've talked about the town acting as the developer, say for Strong Street, mm -hmm. hiring someone to do a design, we'd bring it through permitting and say, I mean, I'm just gonna say like, what if we permit it for six duplexes? I mm -hmm. mean, that hasn't even been studied, but you know, doing something like that right. and then having a phase construction, but at least getting it uh, permitted or something. And so, you know, that's not mm -hmm. uh, as high a priority as the ones that you mentioned, but you know, there's um, a few, I mean, South Amherst School has actually been um, you know, I think the town's going to put some money in there and just study that too, to see it's a few acres, you know, what's kind of feasible and appropriate there. And so mm -hmm. that's something that, um, you know, may use a little bit of the ARPA money, but yeah, I think we have to, you know, see what happens with those projects that you mentioned. Right. Yeah. I mean, cause if the protective plant on strong street is, is not going to put a damper on everything, like it, does seem like that's in the qualified census tract as well. So in terms of if we were looking at a similar thing to what's happening in North Amherst, that might open the door for more funding from other sources, because I think there was that one source that Laura had cited about 
Um, I can't remember what it's called right now, but just, you know, thinking of like strategically yeah. <laughs> about <Yay>, things. Allegra. <laughs> and speaking of Laura, Laura is in the ad audience and has her hand up. I mean, she's an attendee, whatever it is. Anyways, Laura, Greg, can you let Laura come in and speak? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. I just thought if you had a little time to kill, I would fill you in on some of the projects that we're working on. Um, so just wanted to let the trust know that uh, 20 of, oops, sorry. Where are you? We just lost you or something. I just tried to make her a little panelist. She should be back. Oh, sorry, Laura. <laughs> there uh, there she is i'm not camera ready at all oh, i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> i'm joining with my face uh so uh east gables 20 um of those apartments are occupied we expect the balance the remaining eight will be occupied probably by the end of this month or early january um, so we're we're kind of psyched about that. We have been doing a program with incoming tenants where we're um, giving everybody kind of an allowance to buy furnishings because the units are small. And so people have been using Talon Furniture in town as well as Ikea and, and furnishing <laughs> apartments. So it's been a lot of work for everybody, but I think it's, it's a kind of a cool thing. Um, Amherst Community Homes, I will let you know that uh, we've been in the zoning hearings now. I think there have been three or four already. There is one next week on the 21st with the ZBA, and it is the one that might interest people on this committee the most. So it's about affordability restrictions. It's about um, local preference. It's about condo docs. It's about financials. So, you know, they've been plugging away at different aspects like last time it was just storm water <laughs> which drew no one <laughs> but, um, next week I think could be really interesting and interesting discussion and especially on the issue of local preference that's a really juicy one in terms of you know do you do a local preference in a white majority town for a program where you're trying to encourage people of color to buy housing it's a really interesting kind of pickle. So um, it might be a good one to tune into if you have the time. I think they start at seven. It'll be on the, the town calendar. Um, and then I would mention also that uh, we, it, it doesn't, it's not Amherst, but in Hadley, we had purchased the Econo Lodge property. Um, we went, yes. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. We went for a 40B uh, permit. We were denied. We appealed to the housing appeals committee at the state level. Um, and they gave us a favorable ruling um, just last month. So we're we're excited about that. Um, Craig Stores is leasing that property currently. They will continue there until we're ready to renovate. And I think it'll be 18 to 24 months before all the financing is in place and we can renovate. But we're really happy that it's having a good use um, in the interim. Uh, it seems to be working out really well for folks who are staying there. Um, I happened to go to the Pelham hearing last night. I'm oh, sorry, not Leverett hearing on the Kittredge property. And I would just throw that out there because they're looking at building a lot of um, units, some of which will be in Amherst. So that property um, kind of straddles. Uh, most of it's in Leverett, some of it's in Amherst. Who knows? It's very early in the in the conceptual stage, um, but it has potential to 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 have a big impact. And the, the prospective developers are talking about mixed income housing, at least at this point in time. Uh, oh, uh, on East Gables, I just also wanted to mention that uh, there was it was in the paper, but twenty of our incoming tenants. We, we had set aside ten units for people who have who are homeless. We had a homeless preference for ten of the twenty eight units. In fact, of the people moving in, 20 of them are coming from some kind of unhoused situation. Even folks at 50% and 80% AMI, some of them are unhoused, couch surfing, living in cars, whatever. So this problem that is associated with people being you know, very, very poor has broadened to people at different income levels. And I will also mention that we have um, quite a few people who are working locally uh, we have someone who's employed at Amherst College. I think we have two people who work at Big Y, one person who works at the Cumbies. You know, it's really 
nice to see that because I think that was one of the goals, um, including serving people around house, but also providing some kind of housing for people who are, you know, low wage earners who are trying, who work in Amherst, who want to live in Amherst. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Laura. Yeah. I just want to give Laura some big kudos for the win about the Econo Lodge, because at least my understanding is that it was you who did a lot of the work. So yay, Laura. You know, it was uh, a group effort, including oh, I'm sure, the, but... the, including mostly the, the people in Hadley. So yeah. just to be aware that, you know, had they not made choices that they made, we would not have won. So... It's an interesting, it was very interesting process. All right, cool. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Um, Allegra and then Nate. I think Nate was first. <laughs> Nate and then Allegra. <laughs> sure, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Laura. The um, I was going to have just a few things. The ZBA probably will start at six next week. Okay. Um, it would be good to go. Uh, there are some ZBA members who really want... Um, a high local preference. They've actually asked that they could do a hundred percent of the units, <laughs> which isn't possible. Um, and I think Jessica has written Alan from Valley wrote a really clear memo. I mean, staff, uh, totally gets it. You know, the Commonwealth builders program is, has first priority in terms of preference and then local preference would be second. You could have a combined application pool. Um, but it, you know, it could be good if a trust member was there to speak in favor of the project or talk about this. Um, you know, we could also reduce the local preference percentage to say 50% instead of 70% is the maximum. So for a home ownership project, you know, local preference would be that a certain percentage of units would be set aside to people who like live, work, have school aged children uh, in Amherst, and it would be for the initial uh, purchase. And so, you know, it could be 50% of the units are set aside for this. It can't conflict with um, the Commonwealth Builder um, pool, but I think that's, um, you know, something that is, it would, could be a big discussion. I will say that, um, you know, the town is already thinking that, you know, what the conditions are for this project. And so the ZBA has been doing a really good job. I haven't been attending, actually, I get follow-ups, so I, I look at it, watch it after, but they are doing a thorough job, but, you know, really there's, um, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but I think we're looking forward to moving it for, you know, moving it along. And so, you know, it, there is a process, it takes a number of meetings, but, um, you know, I think that's just the process that goes through. Uh, and then lastly, the Leverett piece, there's an article in the Gazette. Well, it's, it was online t this evening. It'll probably be in the paper, physical paper tomorrow, but it, it um, describes the project. And so, you know, it is a pretty big project up on the Amherst Leverett border. Uh, and so that's, yeah. So if you want to read about it, it is, it's out there now. Presumably if it, goes through it we'll be using amherst water and sewer because there's nothing else up there to pull from so yeah yeah the article said that the water and sewer were a mile and a half away i thought it was closer but <laughs> it's a pretty long way to bring water and sewer but yeah anyway um allegra um i was just wondering about the current guests at econo lodge if when the project renovation starts if there would be any attempt for them to become permanent residents of the units or how the, if there would be any continuity for that group of people yeah. um it brings up this um question about local preference yet again um which i'm sure we'll be talking about more in hadley but it, it won't be seamless um We've spoken a lot with Craig Stores about the transition. They do not recommend that we try to renovate while people are living there. So they want to kind of wholesale relocate um, once we're ready to renovate. And then, of course, we would be looking for some people who could apply to live there permanently um, who, who want to. Um, and, you know, hopefully down the road, the VFW site could be another potential location for Craig Stores to kind of plant its flag. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking at a number of steps to permanence, both for, you know, people who live at, at Econo Lodge and for Craig Stores, I think, uh, as an organization. Um, but we're, we're working really closely with them. We have a very good working relationship. Um, they're actually expanding their use of the Econo Lodge. They were using the first floor. 
They're going to set up an emergency uh, overflow shelter on the second floor. They also have some COVID isolation rooms that are on the second floor. So they'll have, they have 38 people living there now. It may go as high as 50 or 60 people over the winter. So it's fulfilling a really critical need um, in its its current use. So, And will that property, once it's complete, have any similar-ish kinds of um, like set aside units as East yeah. Gables? Yeah. So the model that we're working on for, for Econa Lodge, there are 63 double occupancy hotel rooms. We would uh, reduce the density. We'd have 50 apartments, most studios, some one bedrooms, um, and we're looking at 25 having a homeless preference. So, and that's really contingent upon us being able to, to raise 25 project-based vouchers. It's kind of one of the bigger challenges of that, but that's what we're going to try to do um, because that was one of the intents when we purchased it. It was like East Gables, trying to fulfill a need for people who don't have housing as well as kind of workforce housing, especially for people who are working, you know, at the malls and right there on the Route 9 corridor. There's there's a, a huge workforce, I'm sure most of whom don't live locally. So thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. For the update that we didn't plan on, but we're so grateful to have. <laughs> it works on you. Yes. Yeah, really. Fantastic. Uh, I see that now Shelly is here, so maybe we can bring Shelly in and discover more about our strategic the program that we're going to go through for our strategic planning. Greg or Nate or one of you, yes, I see something just happened. So here she is. There, Shelly. All right. So, Shelly, welcome. Hi. Uh, glad to see you. Hi. Nice and to see everyone. Looking forward to hearing what you're going to tell us about the strategic planning process we are about to embark upon. Yeah, thank you. So I am with MHP Mass Housing Partnership. And uh, just to make sure that we all are on the same page, we um, chose Amherst as one of the communities that we're going to focus on um, with more intensive TA as a housing trust in the next several months. And a small group of us met to to kind of talk this out about what this might look like. And so I think what we're wanting to do tonight is propose that timeline I, I don't know if it was put in the information that was sent out. I think it was. Um, <clears throat> so the proposed timeline, just based on the application that you submitted, is tonight to um, go through this timeline. And I don't know if we want to do more kind of introductions, if that's helpful to know more about me or MHP. But um, and, and the one thing that we'd like to do is just go through this timeline and then try to schedule an in-person session for the second half of January to really dig into your kind of brainstorming around goals, the kinds of things that you'd like to accomplish to help get us started. Because our work together is really to help you create a bit of a roadmap for the next at least couple of years of identifying a few key goals, measurable goals to focus on and to create some strategies to just help to focus you for the next couple of years. So um, tonight we'll go through this timeline, um, try to schedule an in-person for the second half of January, and then um, we'll really kick things off in, in January. So the timeline shows us is proposing that on January, your meeting Shelley, for Jan Yep. Shelly, I was just wondering if somebody, Greg, or can someone maybe put the timeline up for us to look at? That might seem like it would be helpful while you're talking about it. Does that sound good, Shelly? Sure. Okay. Um, Keep going. We'll see if it gets there. <laughs> if, if someone wants to sh share the screen and put it up. So January 11th, the proposal is to use that meeting, your standing meeting, for a... Thank you, Greg. For an affordable housing trust 101 virtual session, and so this would be for you, but you could also invite others in the community if they're interested in just learning more. 
Um, and then the second half of January to have an in-person session in Amherst that we really dig into looking at past goals of the trust, what was accomplished from those, what wasn't, a little bit of analysis of why, and then to consider what would you like to accomplish moving forward and do some brainstorming. And then through fe between February and April, hopefully a smaller group, perhaps three of you would meet to dig into those, um, those brainstorm goals and really help to narrow and refine those proposed goals, including to start working on drafting strategies um, of ways to accomplish those goals. And then May and June to bring those that proposal back to the full board to do a bit of, to get some um, feedback and to do some fine tuning. And then June and July, the possibility of facilitating a joint board meeting between the trust and other boards that you find um, critical in your uh, work to discuss the trust goals and strategies and to begin coordinating across different boards. So I don't know if there are uh, from a few of you that were in the initial meeting, if you wanna to add to that, maybe Erica. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, and I'm sorry, I um, I didn't uh, see before we sent out this that something sort of dropped off in June, July. Um, one of the things that um, I think will be really important, not only meeting with other relevant uh, town committees about our, um, our draft goals, it will also be really important to get um, resident feedback, community feedback. So that's to us is going to be really, really important, especially based on the June 20th uh, listening session that we had. Um, it really to get community members feedback where they think we should be focusing our priorities um, would be really important. So um, along the way, maybe even, you know, beginning of June before we get too far as well. So we could have their input, but um, definitely this is, um, you know, you, you, one would think that this might be a long timeline. It isn't. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen. There's a lot of consensus building among ourselves. Um, we discussed how broad affordable housing is, all the way from you know focusing on the unhoused, all the way rental, you know um, subsidies, uh, creating affordable rentals, creating affordable homes, uh, home ownership. Um, you know, subsidizing even vouchers here in Amherst because they don't go very far. There's just so many things, you know, focusing on alternative um, dwelling units. There's just so many aspects of affordable housing that we could focus on. We really need to figure out where we can uh, have the most impact um, and then to also coordinate our work with the CRC, uh, the town, um, also the advocates to make sure that we're really maximizing our efforts and our resources since our resources are very limited and so are theirs. So I think this is such an important process and having, you know, uh, Gaston, our new member, and then our last uh, vacancy filled, uh, it'll really be a good opportunity to also solidify um, how we want to see ourselves and where we want to see ourselves move forward. So thank you, Shelley, for helping us to do that. So uh, with, from MHP's perspective, we work in a lot of communities and we've seen a lot of trust really struggle um, about how to move forward because the housing needs are so significant in every community and the resources are really limited. So the work that we've been doing the last few years in particular is really um, trying to encourage and um, push trust to really narrow in on the work that they're going to focus on to help them be more effective. So um, housing production plans... Um, they can have a, a, a lot of goals and they can be really broad and um, it, it's a great starting place, but then we really are encouraging trust to go a, a little deeper to create goals that are more measurable and to really focus on two or three things that you can do well, instead of being really overwhelmed by trying to do 10 things and struggling with that. So part of this process is hopefully to help you um, identify what are the key things that you're going to be focusing on in the next couple of years. And part of that may be, um, unless you're really rehearsed going into this, uh, understanding what other groups are already doing so that you're not duplicating anything, but really trying to create kind of a niche for, for your trust. And we don't have to be quite this aggressive. We were kind of trying to just to keep things moving, but there is some flexibility if it feels like 
at some point that we need to slow down a little bit. Uh, and then obviously just understanding that the further we get in the summer, then the less that will probably happen. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for your words. And uh, looks like maybe Nate has a question or a comment. Yeah, sure. No, thanks, uh, um, Shelly and Erica. I think, you know, it's important for the trust um, is, you know, we've had a few funding requests in the last year. And so I think it's going to continue that, you know, different projects or um, organizations ask, you know, you know, things of the trust, whether it's time or resources. And so, you know, we could spend down the remaining balance pretty quickly. And then, you know, so some of this would be for me, what, you know, what actions can the trust do with or without funding, you know, and so is it policies, is it recommendations, is it advocacy, and there can be, you know, broad topics that then, you know, um, get more defined in terms of, as Shelly said, measurable actions or strategies. And so I think it could be a few bigger ideas and topics that then we really refine. And so, um, you know, I agree, I don't, you know, we could put a lot in there. So the town's comprehensive housing policy is fairly new, has so many strategies and things, you know, it's really a hard document to say, okay, we're gonna do all of that in two years or four years. And so I think we can look at that. There is some framework with a few documents and ideas. Um, so I, you know, I think that's one thing. Um, the other one would be, um, I think it'd be great if there was, you know, a few trust members who wanted to form a subcommittee. And, it, it, you know, so the difference between a subcommittee and an ad hoc committee would be a subcommittee would be one that uh, has to, you know, post an agenda, take minutes, and it's kind of, you know, appointed or voted on by the trust. And that would be fine. You know, that's something that Greg and I can help manage in terms of meetings. It could just be Zoom meetings. It could be in person. But, um, you know, I think for the next meeting, it'd be great for members to, you know, to ask themselves, you know, would they have the time and are they interested in having a subcommittee of a few members? Uh, and that way, working it done between meetings. And I think it will really help with the process. Uh, you know, we can, staff can help with that in terms of I mean, maybe even Shelly too, but, you know, if we have ideas, you know, where do we look for resources? Are there communities we, we, we research a little bit more? Are there things that are happening? Uh, and that way it just, it can move the process along um, because some of it will take a little bit of research and work. And so that, those are the things I was going to mention. And so Nate, and then an Thanks. ad hoc, an ad hoc group would be where it's not formal like that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for this purpose to me, um, for the planning process, you know, an ad hoc would be like, oh, a few members say, I'll get together and we'll do this. But, um, you know, if they're going to be meeting pretty consistently, I'm okay with saying, let's have a subcommittee for mm -hmm. six months. Just, you know, that way there's some documentation of it as opposed to like, oh, maybe it's the same two members for a few months, but then maybe someone else is added. And mm -hmm. I don't mind formalizing it. Um, like I said, it just means minutes and agendas being posted and things like that. The the group that we've had working so far has been ad hoc, which has been Erica and I and Grover, who've gotten us, who mainly got Shelly here. It's our main accomplishment. So it has been but if something going forward could certainly be different. I'm just trying to say we this is what we have done so far. It doesn't have to stay this way at all. So but we can figure all that out as we go on. But so I think Nate's suggestion is when we meet. On January 11th, we're we're going to start with the, the first thing is kind of going to be, I think, sort of a housing 101 thing at our in our entire next meeting will kind of be devoted to. And at that point, we can try to decide on the time we're going to meet in person in January. And we can also decide on what kind of subcommittee or whatever we want to have. And I see that we have a hand up from our from Gaston. Thank you. Um, just actually on that last point, Carol, I, my understanding of the open meeting law is that if it's more than two, then you better have a committee. Is But uh, since you're co-chairs, does that make a, a a change? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, so the, the, the question I, or comment I had about the strategy is just certainly being new here. I'd be very curious to try to get a, a big picture view about the successes in the past to understand at some level the um the relationship between bandwidth and money and 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 units created or or people housed and so i don't know to what extent that data exists or can be kind of reconstructed but certainly that would be very helpful um to to thinking about the future and and then if I may just kind of put in one idea that's that has been on my mind, um, and and that is 
the um, the huge returns that would come to the town by increasing the number of children, um, because we get more children in town than we we've, we've increased the budget of the schools for free, um, uh, and so it's just such a huge potential to create some of those positive uh, reinforcement loops, um, because I know the schools. Are you know we all know that they're struggling for budgets and and our kids are can't believe what what other towns have and our and our schools uh, don't. So uh, just before Erica, um, I just wanted to respond that Greg has is going to be helping me do some of that research and compiling, uh, like past going through the um, past trust plan and kind of putting together some um, analysis of what's been accomplished, what hasn't, so we can reflect on that at the in-person in January. Great. <clears throat> yeah, I was, just, I, was gonna, sorry, I was gonna say quickly, unfortunately, some of it's kind of in different groups, right? So the planning board might work on some zoning measures. There's a community resources committee, a subcommittee of the council. There's the trust, there's town had been doing, you know, applying for CPA. So I think we can speak to it, but, you know, um, I, you know, I think what, you know, we had a joint meeting with the trust and CRC earlier this year, and we said, oh, it'd be nice to have these periodically, you say it's twice a year, because there is so much that happens, you know, with different departments or different boards or committees in town. And so I think, Gaston, to your point, I think, you know, part of what this process for me is also like, you know, how do we coordinate efforts? You know, and we've talked about that. How do we, um, how do we keep things kind of, um, you know, relevant for everyone. And so, you know, Dave and I meet with Carol and Erica uh, at least once a month and we're trying to, you know, some of it's just, it might be having more more meetings or more things, but, you know, uh, for instance, the, the planning board is looking at rezoning um, East Amherst or certain areas, right? University Drive or looking at certain things. And, you know, is the trust, uh, if say a, a point is um, advocacy or regulations or regulatory thing, you know what how involved does the trust get with some of those those conversations is it you know we set a framework and the trust attends meetings or writes a memo but i think yeah i think there's a you know i think there's probably a lot of successes and things that need to be improved but you know i can help shelly and greg pull together i just think it comes from a lot of different places um and, well i was thinking of the action plan the trust action plan specifically just as kind of a starting point to see what did they what did the trust expect to or want to and to help with kind of um, what were maybe some goals that that didn't end up being achieved and, and why, as we kind of think about what to do moving forward, what to focus on moving forward. But I think knowing what others are doing is part of not wanting to duplicate and um, kind of finding the trust niche that's not overlapping with other other entities, that's really important. Erica. So, thank you. I was just going to add. Um, so, uh, I've asked John Hornick, who is our prior chair, to work with me to literally, and Carol as well, to look at our prior strategic plan and actually come up with what we've accomplished and um, what areas we didn't get accomplished. And um, this conversation is really uh, good because it'll help us frame too the why. I didn't really think about the why. Um, so we will, um, I've actually gone through um, all of that I can. I only started, I think in, in 2019. So prior to 2019, I wasn't here. So that's why it'd be really important to have John um, part of this. Um, so I'm gonna get my thoughts to John this weekend and then um, hopefully we'll make a meeting and definitely have that available at the meeting where we're going to review past. Um, it is important to know where we've come from in order to know where we're heading. So that is really important. And I just also wanted to say is that with the meeting of the CRC, I believe Nate and Dave actually did put a lot of data together for us. So those documents might be useful for everybody to have before we have those conversations. Great. Uh, any last comments or questions before we move on and thank Shelley? So I, I would just say that it because I have to um, schedule childcare for the January in-person meeting, that the sooner that we get that in our calendars, the better for me. So it doesn't have to be done tonight, but um, waiting until January 11th would actually be really hard for me. 
Okay. We'll try to, we'll do it somehow so, sooner than that. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yep. So I don't know if, I mean, I could put together a poll or someone could put together a poll to try to get that in our calendars. And I think another thing we we're going to bring up tonight is just to ask the group, how early in the evening could you start a meeting realistically? Like, could you start as early as five or five thirty? Does it need to be six or six thirty? What What are people's schedules like on a typical weeknight? Are we talking about our regular meetings, or are you talking about the in person thing? The in person meeting. Um. Well, maybe we can put out some kind of questionnaire, or you you can, or we can. do. You want to, and are you do you or do you want us to? I can, I just don't have everybody's email from here, but I could send it to you or you and Erica and you could send it to the group. That sounds good. I'll Do that. And we can also ask the question of how, of what time, what starting time can work. Like if it's a, if it's a questionnaire, uh, that if it's a poll, then it would be, I would put in the time. So I just need to kind of know how, how early is realistic or, or what's the time frame that you typically prefer. Um, if it's in person in Amherst. I'm trying to think of a way to do that besides just taking the time in this meeting, but maybe everyone who's on the trust, if you have a time that is when is the earliest time you could start, if we just go around and each say that, and if you don't know, then we'll figure out something else. But let's see, I would say I could do five if I knew far enough in advance. Erica? I'm flexible. Uh, Allegra? Five. You said five, right? Yes. Rob? Rob? I could do five. Grover? I could do five with planning ahead. Yeah. Uh, Gaston? Yeah, f five, five is fine or possibly earlier, but yeah, five, no problem. Okay. Does that work then? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, great. It. Thanks for asking. So I'll put together a poll. I'll send Carol and Erica the link, and then you can send it to everyone else. We'll try to get a, a, a date for the second half of January in our calendars soon. Great. Thank you okay. very much. Yeah, Sorry, thanks just, for coming. Just quickly, I'm assuming that we could, um, it'll be in town hall, uh, or it could be the banks, and I guess, right? I mean, I think those are probably the two easiest locations. Yeah, we have to find a place too, so. Okay. Okay. Another benefit to getting the date earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, thank Good you point. so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good night, thank Shelley. You. Thanks care. for coming. Good thank night. You, Shelley. Okay, so where are we? Oh, we're. I'm turning it back over to Erica for funding proposals. Thank you, Carol. Um, so we've had a little bit of change of plans. Um, uh, Ashley couldn't make it this evening, so she asked us to postpone the conversation about her proposal regarding rental support or eviction prevention. Um, but we do have um, someone here from the uh, Amherst Community Land Trust, I believe Jim Oldham. Um, I believe you're going to present the proposal. So uh, Jim has his hand up. Uh, can we make him a panelist? I think also Linda's Lakey, unless she doesn't want to come into the room, but she's also from ACLT. I'm going to recruit myself from this discussion uh, for the benefit of Gaston and anyone else. I'm on the board of the Amherst Community Land Trust. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> okay, so we have Jim here. Jim, do we do you want us to also include Linda? Please, yes. We'll bring Linda in as well. Looks like Linda has been made into a panelist. Let's see if Linda has arrived. And if I can share my screen, I can. Just... I believe you should, you... you should be able to. Yep. Okay. I'm I gotta interrupt for a second. I'm technically a member of ACLT and that perhaps means that I should also recuse myself. If I recuse myself, am I supposed to entirely leave? I don't know that I understand this all very well. Well, I 
um, recusing yourself from voting if we were to take a vote. I think being here and listening, um, I think, is not an issue. Um, but I think if we were to take a vote this evening about the proposal, then um, both you and Rob would probably have to recuse yourself. But Nate, yeah, you can correct well, me if I'm wrong. Rob just, Rob just recused himself by leaving, didn't he? He's not even here anymore, is he? Rob, Rob was on the board. Um, so if, if Rob recused himself totally, it's maybe because he felt being on the board. Um, being a member, I think, is very different. I, well, my, comment. <laughs> my question comment to that is if Kara leaves and Rob has left and Ashley's not here, would we have enough quorum to have a vote? Well, you know what? Um, I think we probably don't, uh, but I think it'd be important to go ahead and allow um, Jim and Linda to present the proposal. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, why don't we start with that? But I think that's a very good point, Grover. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say that, you know, Rob's a, uh, on the board of directors. Um, so I think that makes sense for Carol. I think just that your disclosure and you could say that, you know, it does, being a member doesn't impact your ability to hear the proposal and discussion is all that really needs to happen. Um, you know, I think it's different if you're on, a, you know, like an executive, you know, board or committee for something. So. Okay. So, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, and I, I certainly hope you find a way to, to vote on this proposal, hopefully tonight, but well, I'll, I'll try to be compelling. Uh, so I know you've had, or many of you have had an introduction to ACLT, so I will keep it brief, but I will do a, a little bit of background uh, because I, I know you have new members and, and so on. So we're a nonprofit organization serving the town of Amherst, uh, we've been around coming up on 10 years. Uh, we're volunteer led and uh, we work to create affordable home ownership. So we that's the space of the housing space that we occupy and are really focused on making home ownership possible for folks who otherwise wouldn't have access to housing because of income, uh, access to ownership and um, promoting, uh, and by doing that, we're promoting uh, diverse, uh, more diverse family neighborhoods. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry. When I'm looking at your screen, I can't see my, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides. Hang on one second. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, the basic uh, practice of the the Amherst, uh, Amherst Community Land Trust, as a community land trust, we use a particular ownership model of shared equity ownership uh, in which the homeowner owns home the home on land owned by the land trust. So we acquire land, we steward the land, and, and hold it for community benefit, primarily making the land, making the homes affordable uh, for low and moderate income uh, homeowners. So the goals are to remove the land from the, remove the homes from the speculative market and create home ownership opportunities um, for, again, for those who wouldn't otherwise have it. And, uh, the, the price of the home is less because we've taken the, the land or some fraction of the total value out of the picture. And we use a lease to the land as the regulatory method for um, ensuring certain restrictions are, are abided by, for, uh, particularly we, um, is to promote um, owner occupancy, these aren't for rental units, these are to be lived in by the people who own them. And um, we we restrict resale price so that they'll remain affordable for subsequent home buyers. And um, our work is, although there's uh, been an, an import, important exceptions, we primarily focus on existing housing stock. So what we're working to do is, is um, transition existing housing stock into 
affordable housing stuff. Uh, and there's a range of benefits. Um, we're, we're, we're creating a home ownership for people who otherwise are priced out. And that really is facilitating wealth building for people at the lower end of the economic ladder. So uh, there's, uh, we have this perpetuation in our, in our society, wealth is perpetuated by more wealth and, and home ownership is one of the biggest uh, tools for that, as you know. So by helping people at the lower end of the perspective, at the lower end of the spectrum, uh, acquire homes, um, in an ownership position, we're, we're helping them build wealth. Uh, the model works for a range of income levels. We've primarily worked uh, with um, home buyers between 50 and 80% AMI, but uh, we can also provide housing for people in the 80 to 100% AMI, which are no longer, who are no longer able to afford homes in Amherst. And, and we can even go lower uh, when we can get a subsidy sufficient. Um, as I'll show later, the cost of the subsidy for this model is relatively low compared to other approaches like new build housing. Um, and the affordability is preserved long-term. Um, and, and at the same level. So if we can make a home affordable for someone at 70% AMI today, when they sell it, uh, the model allows us per, to perpetuate that affordability at that same level. And we've built our program in a way that, that we're backstopping ourselves. We're a 10 year old now or nonprofit organization all of our uh, ACLT homes have deed restrictions that are either granted to the town or held by the state uh, with the town having enforcement rights. So it's our intention to remain in business and continue to steward these homes and oversee their transition, uh, but, but the homes are permanently protected, whatever happens with our organization. To date, we've um, acquired five properties, which have a total of six homes on them. Because the first one was a duplex, um, and all all providing affordable home ownership. Uh, the, I won't go through the whole list here, but um, just say that the. Um, We've come at these projects from a variety of different ways, working, partnering with Habitat for Humanity. That's the one new build project we did, uh, using CPA money to acquire a house in the um, on the open market. Uh, homes either bequeathed to us or where the land was donated to us, uh, make up the, the rest of the portfolio. And so, this has all happened over six years, really, since 2018 when we did our first project. Um, and it's been funded the majority through private donations. We've um, made a little more than, as you can see here, a little more than 25% of ACLT's homes uh, the, the direct subsidy for acquisition I and mean, the direct funding for acquisition and providing the subsidy, uh, almost three quarters of that has come from donated land, donated cash, and the balance has come from, from CPA money. Uh, as the note on the slide says, um, omitted from this uh, calculation is money is some of the funding that Habitat brought in uh, for the build of the first project. But um, as you can see, uh, that's so this is about 1.2 million, a little higher when you add in the additional habitat money uh, for six units of permanently affordable housing. So we're looking at about 250,000, 200 to $250,000 uh, a unit is, is achieving that, which again, I think compared to other types of um, projects is a pretty good, um, pretty good, uh, cost to benefit ratio. Um, however, you know, we do need to get enough to, to make these projects happen. So so what I want to share now is where we are now. We, we have a project 
that was actually funded back in 2019. Um, it, the CPA uh, program provided ACLT with uh, two subsidies of $125,000 each, uh, plus a small amount of um, funds for management that we're paying to Valley CDC to help us with um, uh, uh, home buyer selection and advertising marketing. They've done most of that work. Um, but anyway, two subsidies of 125,000 that were we received in, in um, fiscal year 2019. Took a while to set up the program because it was new for us and new for the state. Uh, and then got started just at the as the pandemic came uh, started. One family was able to acquire a home, and at seventy percent AMI, which is what we targeted the program to, um, depending on family size, they can bring one hundred fifty to one hundred eighty thousand dollars to to the table for a home. So that plus. Our $125,000 subsidy allowed one family in 2021 to purchase a home for $285,000. Now, today, there are no homes in Amherst anywhere near $285,000. So, in fact, the prices in, in Amherst have risen 50% in, in the past five years. Um, exactly the period where we were carrying, have been carrying out our projects. So we've done our work in that environment. Uh, so we had a Crazy. second subsidy to use. I'm sorry? I thought I heard a comment, a question. Um, we, we had a second subsidy and the written, um, I won't repeat what's in the write-up that we sent to you ahead of time, but there was we we had several um, candidates selected for homes. One withdrew when they weren't able to find a home. A second went into a different program where we were able to get them housed uh, with the donated property. We still have this subsidy. We realized one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars wasn't close to getting um, anyone into a home. So we raised privately $75,000. So we now have a $200,000 subsidy, which brings a potential purchase price to somewhere between $350,000 and $380,000. Again, this is insufficient to buy any home in Amherst, really. There, there's virtually nothing in, on the market for, for $380,000. We're closer. There are homes being advertised in the low 400s, but 350 to 380 uh, just doesn't do it. And so where we are now is we actually have a home buyer who was selected, income qualified, selected through the application and lottery process uh, overseen by Valley CDC. Uh, they happen to be a single parent, they happen to be a current resident in Amherst, and they're a school employee. They're unable to, they've been making offers, but the offers are, uh, they're, they're not even able to meet asking price um, or even get close to asking price. We're looking to complement the fundraising that we've done from within our own organization and our um, broader networks, we're looking to AMHT for an additional $25,000, which we think will complete enough of a package to get us where we can, where the joint purchase request between ACLT and the home buyer can get to the very bottom of the Amherst market just enough to get them into a home. So we're, we're, this is a minimal request to get us at the very bottom. And we believe that if, if AMHT would, would approve this, we can get these, this family to become homeowners by early 2024 and add another permanently affordable 
owner-occupied home to the Amherst uh, housing stock. Uh, it's urgent. They they are looking um, currently. They're seeing houses that they are are hoping to um, be able to make offers on. Uh, there are houses that are sitting on the market and may be beginning to come down in price. So we could meet those home buyers if we had them, I mean, those home sellers if we had the money. Uh, but it is time sensitive and it's a small amount to supplement a lot of money that's been raised, um, again, privately and the earlier CPA um, funds that are, are earmarked. So I'll stop there and take questions and I'll stop my share so you can see. Questions from the trust members? Uh, Grover? Yeah, thanks for your presentation. And I really appreciate the effort and that you're trying to get things together to make it work. My question is, you raised an extra 75,000. And then if we were to grant this request, are you also recruiting funds elsewhere? And I ask that because because the home needs to be a single family home that's not part of a condo already condoized unit it looks to me like even this amount of money might not succeed in the goal and so um then I, my concern would be that we would allocate $25,000 that might not get spent might not be used to house a family for many more years it so we it was a tough choice how much to ask for, honestly. Perhaps we should have asked for more, but we were, were not certain. We, we know the trust is trying to support a lot of things and, and weren't sure. So certainly a little bit higher would give us some more certainty. We do have other funds that we um, use slightly differently. So we have what we call a last mile fund that we've raised $11,000 in that would, could comp. So if we came up, if, if we got 25,000 from the trust and we're still somewhere up to $11,000 short, we could use this last mile fund, which we would not use as a permanent subsidy. It's intended to be a rotating money, but it would work as a a second mortgage, a no interest second mortgage that people could either pay off and therefore gain more equity or could leave and pay off at the time they sell the, the house. So so we we are building in some flexibility and we're we're constantly looking, you know, we're we're not stopping fundraising. We actually have an open um campaign going on right now. Just um we're we're we don't have any other prospects outside of the housing trust for where we could get a chunk of money of this magnitude in the time frame that we're we're talking about. Any other questions from the trust members? We have a question from one of the attendees. Um, let me just ask first trust members, any other questions from trust members? Grover, do you still have a question? Nope, okay. Um, Greg, can we allow John to ask his question? Um, yeah, I saw Carol too, or? Oh, sorry, I didn't see Carol's team, but. Yeah. Okay, I had actual... my this this hand, which is <laughs> oh, sorry, can't see That's it. Okay. It's... <laughs> yeah, I I get it, I get it. I mean, I have I have a. It's not a question; it's a comment, and it's not about this proposal. And this proposal is compelling enough that I'm having a hard time even making my comment. But part of me thinks that we should not that we should go through our strategic planning process that we're just beginning before we spend any more of our money. Uh, it's not because I'm not, I, what you just said almost convinced me to not say this at all, but uh, I, f I feel like we're, we are, don't have a lot of money now. We have just reduced our ask to the CPA funds. 
We don't really know what we're going to come up with as our priorities that we're just entering into this process to try to figure out. And so to me, it feels like a hard time for the trust to to make another award. That's my comment. Thank you, Carol. Um, could we ask, oh, Allegra, go ahead, Allegra. See, I'm the opposite of Carol. I'm over here on Zillow <laughs> looking at the 419 on Logtown Road. <laughs> I'm like 11,000 plus 400 and they are saying a 5K credit to the seller. That's almost there. Like, let's do this. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have dropped that little gem into the public realm. Um, I just, I will say, even if we decide to postpone the vote today, that this is a really cool proposal. I feel like the past couple of months, we've had a lot of different things in front of us. And, you know, we've given some money to fund building or development stuff for a home ownership opportunity. We've given money for subsidies for, you know, 30% AMI and lower folks for a whole year to keep them housed. And I think this proposal that has like a really human piece to it, it's, you know, it, it might seem like a big amount of money for one family to get housed, but at the same time, it it's one family that we're getting more information about. So we can kind of like picture this is a, a family that lives here already, works in the school system. Maybe the kids are in the school system. So I think, I think that it's really nice to hear kind of the human side of things whereas sometimes when we're giving funds to the development of a building you know it's a nice thing to see a pretty picture of what the building is going to look like but it's it doesn't feel as real as thinking like oh wow like this one family has had a struggle in this market and I can picture that because you know, I'm a family who who has looked at different houses before and understands that process. So I, I appreciate that piece of this proposal being brought in front of us. Thank you, Allegra. Um, looks like Linda, you would like to respond. Just, I, I can't resist sharing that it is in fact 111 Logtown Road that our current client is looking at and and uh, we've done exactly the calculation that you just did twenty five thousand dollars would make that home she could make a viable offer with that their their original ask was 435 and they've been languishing on the market partly because of course as you all know interest rates rates have also risen sharply and therefore buyers are hanging back um, and that lends some of the time urgency you know, every time I see the interest rates come down even a tiny bit, I think, oh, who's going to jump on Logtown Road before we can get it together? Thank you, Linda. It looks like we have no questions from our trust members, so we can go ahead and ask John to join us and ask his question or make a comment. Yeah, I have a comment. It's not a question. Um, most of the what the trust does is make affordable rental housing available. If we look at the East Street or Belchertown Road projects, um, those are rental projects. Um, the Ball Lane project is really the first affordable housing ownership project that we have funded except for very small projects taken on by the Amherst Community Land Trust uh, uh, and uh, uh, two other organizations. Um, and they happen in very, very occasional, almost random fashion. You know, there's an opportunity this year to do one. There's an opportunity next year or two years from now to do another one. Ball Lane is some years away. So the fact is that this is a relatively unique opportunity to allow home ownership, which we rarely get an opportunity to do. So if you hold off, as Carol suggests, we could lose this opportunity, which is important. 
Um, and I think the fact that it's a home ownership project is something that people need to think about. It's not another big rental project. It's home ownership. It's something we generally are able to do one project at a time, and it's one every year or every two years. So my recommendation would be not to let this one get away. Thank you, John. Very much appreciated. Uh, Allegra. I am wondering if there's a way that we could write, we could move to propose some sort of contingent, like upon getting agreement accepted type language in recommending funding. I'm not clear what you're recommending. <laughs> well, Sorry. I, guess I think I can I try to say it. It's like yes. give me the twenty five. <laughs> we'll give you the money when you have a house to spend it on. Yeah, it's Is unnecessary. Right? The it's town unnecessary? will. will yeah, the town will not pay out the money unless there is a contractual agreement to purchase the house. Okay. So I understand your thought, Allegra, but it's not necessary to create special language. That's the way the town ordinarily operates. Well, can we get confirmation that that's true? Because uh, the request is from ACLT. Not from the home, whatever. So, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No. John's right. We would have a, a you know a grant agreement with the land trust, and it would say that um, you know, for instance, an accepted offer or a purchase and sale agreement or something, and then we would provide funding. So, typically, we'd have a condition or two, um, you know, to ensure that that was moving forward. So it's kind of like, you know, the way it works is the trust votes the money, it allocates it, and it only gets spent if it's necessary. So you know if town council or town meeting before that would allocate funding for a project, it's not like the money's out the door. It only gets spent when it's needed. And so, you know, if it never gets spent, it never gets spent. Um, yeah. And, and I'll just note that that, I mean, this money, we, we will have to do that for the 125,000 that that town is holding for us anyway. So we would be coming for the, into town hall for two checks instead of one, I guess, or one bigger check or. Gaston, go ahead. Um, I guess two, two, two comments. One, just on the question of contingency, I would, I would guess that one could just be a date, you know, um, put a, li a time limit. Um, and then the other point is just that as somebody new here, I'm getting my bearings about value. And so, you know, I'm thinking um, at, you know, at the rate of $25,000 per housing, that means, you know, the mil a million dollar trust would go up in 40, it would serve 40 families. And I just don't have a sense of proportion yet as to the, the mission and scope of the trust as to whether that's a good return on on the investment or not. I mean, so I, I just have ignorance at this point, lack of sense of proportion about the money uh, relative to the impact. Uh, but as far as the the point about um, will the money make the difference, I, I would I would I guess propose that there be a time limit on the on the on the grant if that's the the way the trust is going to vote. Thank you, Gaston. So. Um... We don't have a quorum, so we cannot vote tonight. Um, so uh, to Grover's point, um, we need a quorum in order to be able to vote. Um, we have about $200,000 left that um, even if we do get funding from the CPA, it won't even be until, I believe, after July 2024, correct, Nate? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and um, I think, you know, between what Gaston just said and what Carol said, um, you know, we're, we're struggling with wanting to make as um, impactful decisions as possible. I think, you know, I, I would agree with Carol and with Allegra that a personal story always pulls at, you know, at your consciousness and in, in your, um, you know, at 
it's really hard to not see this single mom who is working in town trying to get uh, a house in town. I myself, I know how, how hard it was to, to get a house. But at the same time, we're also struggling with really wanting to be very, very judicious in how we spend our money. And that's one of the reasons why we've decided to go into this process of, of, uh, of uh, planning. Um, but the bottom line is, is that at this point, we can't um, vote. Um, and I'm, I know, Jim uh, and Linda, you said that time is of the essence. Um, we are not going to have another meeting until January. Um, so I'm not sure um, if that is even helpful, um, waiting until January to, to have this vote. But without a quorum, we can't vote. Um, and it looks like Nate may have a response to that. I see five members, um, you know, uh, Estone, Erica, you, Allegra, Grover, and Carol. So Carol could vote. Yeah, I mean, I looked at the membership is, it's not, you know, um, I think it's, I think if she, you know, discloses it, that's fine. It's not like it's a, um, she's not a voting member of any, you know, she's not on the board of directors, so. And there could be hundreds of members of the Amherst Community Land Trust. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many, I don't know what the membership is, but it's a, it's a kind of a, a low threshold membership. It's not like an exclusive thing. So I don't, I think a disclosure is all that's necessary to allow Carol to vote. If, you know, if. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is I'll allow Jim to make one comment and then I'll open up to the trust members to make a decision about if somebody wants to put forth a vote. I also, I don't want to get involved in the technical stuff, but I believe when someone removes themselves, refuses themselves, but you had a quorum when they came, I don't believe they stopped counting for quorum just because he left the meeting for the purpose of this. Uh, so I defer to, to Nate or, or, or others on that. The comment I want to make is, I, I appreciate you, you all considering this. I do want to, and I appreciate your noting the um, the strength of the personal argument, but I, I do want to call your attention again to, to some of the information that was in the slides. I believe that we're, um, although we do our projects one at a time, as John noted, they're adding up and they're going to continue to add up if, if we can get uh, the funding. And I think you'll see that there is taking less public money on a per unit basis than say home ownership on Ball Lane uh, in terms of, of so, so just think about the personal thing and we can tell you about the people, but also look at how much the public money is being leveraged. And if, if you put this money in, $75,000 of donated money will help make this house permanently affordable, not just for this family, but for the people who come afterwards. So so I, I don't want, just because I can tell a good story about the person, I don't want the effectiveness of our program to be lost. Thank you, Jim, that's very helpful. Okay, um, due to time, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a trust member to go ahead um, and does anyone want to make a motion? Sure, I will make a motion. I move that we um, we grant twenty five thousand dollars of our funding to the Amherst Community Land Trust to make home ownership a possibility for this family. Is there a second? All right, I'm not hearing a second. Oh. I second it, even though I said we shouldn't do it. I changed my mind. Carol seconded. Um, okay, so uh, now it's open for discussion. Is there any discussion about the motion? Okay. I guess I, it's in relation to the motion. So just yep. to review, the, the disposable budget of the trust at this time is 
is is what number? You said 250,000? No, 200,000. 200,000. Um, okay, thank you. That was my question. So I did a little bit of math, like not very much, but just enough. Um, I could just so hear I that. I could just barely hear you. I, I, hear somehow. I was looking at, so I, the last big, the biggest amount we've given recently was 375,000 to the ball lane development. Correct. And that's 15 duplexes that will have two, so 30 homes altogether. So that comes out to 12, five per, I guess, per unit that we are, that we just provided in that sense. So half of what this ask is yet, if we look at how much that money was in the grand budget of that whole project, project right? it's a lot less um, in terms of like 25,000 to 400,000. I don't even know what the main, I can't, my, Math is not my thing, so I apologize, and it's getting late, so I'm my brain isn't really functional. But I, I guess, I guess we have different kinds of opportunities in front of us. So I think that this, while it might seem like a lot of money for one house, it might not be that much in the scheme of things. Although I, yeah, that's. I thought Gaston I, I wonder if um if John would um offer his perspective on on the 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 budget issue given that he spoke strongly in support of uh granting the funds uh, Greg could you bring John back and, and I just want to, um, before John speaks, I just want to note it is 9.03. I'm fine with continuing a little, little bit longer. I just want to make sure no one has to leave. None of the trust members have to leave because if you leave, we can't vote. Okay, John, go ahead. I can't remember a time when the trust was asked for less money than $25,000. <laughs> uh, in general, we're talking about amounts that run anywhere from a hundred thousand to half a million so this is a very small ask um and granted we don't know exactly what we're going to get we're probably going to get something from uh the community preservation act committee you're probably going to get something from uh the town council will approve i can't believe that twenty five thousand dollars is going to be make the difference between being able or not being able to do some future project. So uh, again, I, I feel like the amount is small enough, the project is important enough that you should consider it very seriously. Thank you, John. Grover? Yeah, I just want to say um, I appreciate this, the, this conversation. It's successfully shifting me away from my initial response. And I am noting that we've allocated a number of thousands of dollars just to keep the light on in the parking lot of the VFW uh, parcel while we're waiting on it to be developed. And so for me, um, if I vote yes on this project, it will in part be because I know that it means that a family will be housed at an affordable rate within the year, which is also not something we're often seeing. We're often giving money um, that's going to be used to house somebody for years from now. And so yeah. that's valuable. Thank you, Grover. So I'm going to go ahead. Oh, Allegra, go ahead. Sorry, just to belabor the point even more. Looking at our, our most recent allocation of funding to Craig's doors, it was about 15000 per individual. So Again, this is a little bit higher than that per individual, but as Grover just said, it's hopefully a more immediate return on an investment in terms of if this identified property does work, um, that could be a matter of months as opposed to like a matter of 2028 when we will see the Southeast Street buildings come to fruition. Um, 
Thank you. Gaston? I mean, I'll, I'll just say that I'm, um, I, I'm also now being feeling inclined to, uh, to vote in, in support. One, uh, I, I think I appreciate the perspective from John. Two, uh, the group is about to go into a strategic planning process and you know, feeling the, the, the spending of money now will serve us well, even if we come to think that it, it, there were uh, issues with the decision. And so um, I, I appreciate the fact that this could work if we move quickly. And we can second guess ourselves later, but if we don't approve it now, the 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 window will will slide away. Thank you, Gaston. All right, I think we're ready to vote. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, uh, unless there's any compelling comments anyone wants to make. Not seeing any hands. <clears throat> All right, Allegra. Yes. Carol. Yes. Grover. Yes. Gaston? Yes. Aye. And I will vote a yes. So we have five yeses. So I think we have all decided that this is a worthwhile opportunity. Um, I do believe that I think, um, Nate, you are the expert in creating whatever contract and timelines. Um, it would be really important for us to find out, Jim and Linda, um, hopefully it'll be successful, but if you could report back to us, uh, in terms of, um, the success of this partnership that we just had with you, even though it was a small amount, it hopefully will have a huge meaningful impact on this family. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank and you. Can I just say, will you share the information about fundraising efforts that you are doing just in case anybody else listening is compelled to give additional funds. <laughs> uh, they can, they can uh, find, uh, find us at Amherst Community Land Trust. I don't recommend that you Google on ACLT. That acronym is common. It will be several pages down. Uh, but if you Google on Amherst Community Land Trust, um, you will find uh, a lot more about us, including um, the address to which contributions can be sent. We're actually having our own strategic planning, a, a mini version that we do annually at this time. Um, so in our January board meeting will be devoted to reassessing priorities we set last year and establishing really an action plan for 2024. But we do have on the table now $31,000 toward a $50,000 ask that is primarily about uh, help being able to help our existing homeowners meet unexpected expenses. Um, uh, one of our long-term goals, if any anyone listening <laughs> is so moved to help us, um, we, uh, as Jim pointed out, are a totally volunteer organization. Uh, everything we do is done by volunteers. And we really, again, as the number of resident family grows, uh, we need to plan for somebody to mind the store. So we're looking toward establishing uh, an amount of money that would let us make a commitment to, for at least half-time employment uh, for someone to be um, supporting the effort and helping to manage the volunteer effort. Thank you, Linda. And if you want to send us a, the, the direct link, we could also share it with everyone as well. But we've also <laughs> shared the slides. So if that link is on those slides, we can you know, make sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our meeting. Um, announcements. Uh, Nate had sent out um, a copy of the application form for 11 East Street, um, three affordable housing projects, uh, units, <laughs> three affordable housing units there. Uh, the application is due on February 7th, so there's a really tight deadline. And there's also an info session January 11th at 6 p.m. So I've just sent it out uh, to an individual who's looking um, desperately for some affordable housing, uh, but please share it as, um, as much as possible. Um, three, three units are gonna be tough and I'm sure there gonna be a lot of people asking um, and applying for that. Um, also uh, Valley CDC, Carol, did you wanna say something? I'm sorry. I thought there were more than three, but anyway, I don't know, go ahead. 
Okay. Um, um, there's two separate, one is at Center East Commons, and I think that has three, and it's a combination of studio and one bedroom, and then 11 has, 11 East Pleasant has a few more, I don't remember exactly how many, but it's a mix of studio, one and two bedrooms. I think you. it might have been nine units. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that correction, nine units. Okay. Okay, um, but you all got the uh, email from Nate. Um, so uh, please pass it along, share it with everyone. Um, then Valley CDC is doing their first time homeowner. This is, uh, you know, they, they have her, um, these series multiple times, but the first one in January, starting January 10th. And they're very, very beneficial. Um, this one is three meetings. I've actually attended one that I think was about 10 meetings. Um, and it's so very beneficial for people who have never bought a home before. It really walks you through all of the different processes. And it is a complex process. And if you're full-time working and have a family and managing other things, it's really so important to go through something like this to help you navigate buying your first home. Um, so um, please share that as well. Um, so now I'm, I, we actually have the decision not to include public comments when it's late. I think we've included public comments throughout the period. So I think it's okay. Unless I see a hand that really wants to say something, I'm going to move, um, to, um, just ask if there are any major, in, uh, non-anticipated items. Um, I know Gaston sent us two articles that I shared with everyone on alternative dwelling units, which I think is really important to read for our strategic planning process. We've talked about diversity of our um, strategies. So, um, you know, from rentals, from supporting alternative dwelling units, from zoning, et cetera. So I think it'd be very pertinent to, you know, read these articles and be ready to have a real, um, you know, in-depth conversation about where we see our efforts um, making the most impact. Um, but unless, you know, there's anything else, I'm going to move on that. Okay. Um, and then you have it on the agenda, um, possible future, future agenda items. Um, so it was noted that January 11th, our meeting is going to uh, specifically focus on affordable housing development 101. And the um, idea for that was, is to have all trust members be on the same page around, you know, what are the different initiatives, options. Um, Shelly is going to talk about some of the different initiatives across the state that trusts have been involved in. So it gives us really sort of a base to work off of when we start thinking about where we think our goals should be for the next few years. Um, and we've also talked um, about uh, having the um, African Heritage Reparation Assembly come and speak. Um, we have not yet um, been able to do that, but it's something that we'll have in the future. So it is now 914, unless there is anything else, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Okay. I think everyone's ready to have the meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. This was a really important conversation. Thank you for your engagement and participation and um, keep on sending articles and sharing them. And I look forward to seeing all of you January 11th, where we're gonna talk about the full aspect of what affordable housing trusts do and start our process for making a decision about what we're going to do and how we're going to impact affordable housing in Amherst. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Thank you. Good, good job, Ray. thanks Erica. <laughs> thank you, I'm sorry it was took longer, but- Oh, it's I okay, think it happens sometimes, all right. Yeah, yeah. it was an important question. All right, good to see you. Right, Mike. Yeah.